Hello there! In this video, I'm going to talk about the Spadina Expressway, or as it's known as today, the Allen Road Expressway. This is quite possibly the most controversial project in Toronto's history, yet also one of the most important in it. As well, June of 2021 will mark the 50th anniversary of this project's cancellation, so there is no better time than now to tell its story. So, without further ado, let's get into the video. The origins of the Spadina Expressway trace back to the 1950s. However, the idea of something greater for Spadina Avenue dates back to 1947. It was in that year that planners looked at the construction of a major arterial road west of the downtown core. This would take form as a merged Spadina Avenue and Spadina Road, with the latter being widened and extended to St. Clair Avenue. This would require the road to cut through the escarpment north of Davenport Road. This road expansion would be put to a referendum as part of the 1948 municipal election. The referendum would pass, albeit narrowly, by a vote of 34,261 for and 32,078 against. Due to this narrow margin, Toronto City Council would hold off on the construction of the road although it had been tentatively approved. The idea would briefly pop up again in 1949 when the Toronto and Suburban Planning Board proposed its Northwest Drive, otherwise known as the Spadina Road Extension. This idea, however, would not go anywhere as the York Township rejected the idea. By the 1950s, the city's continued suburbanization and growth in car ownership would see plans change for Toronto's highway network. What may have worked in the 40s likely wasn't going to work now. One of these changes would be with the Spadina Road extension, which was now to be a full-blown expressway. By 1959, the Spadina Expressway was now part of the official highway plan, which was now being overseen by the recently created Metropolitan Toronto government. From north to south, the Spadina Expressway under this plan was to begin its journey north of Toronto in the then township of Vaughan. The highway would start at what was referred to as the Highway 403 Bypass, which was to be in the vicinity of what is today's Highway 407. The highway would have then traveled south at grade to Eglinton Avenue, with a connection to Highway 401 being made. The highway would have then dipped into a trench and followed the Cedarvale and Nordheimer ravines to a connection to the proposed Crosstown Expressway south of DuPont Street. The highway would then reach its southern terminus at Bluer Street. South of Bluer Street, Spadina Avenue may have been expanded to include separated express lanes in the middle down to the waterfront. I cannot say how this would have been achieved, so take this particular section of the project with a grain of salt. The plan for the Spadina Expressway would change in the early 1960s. By this time, the highway was now planned to run from Wilson Avenue in the north and join Spadina Avenue in the south at Harbord Street. It was estimated that this highway would cost $65 million, which is about $580.8 million today, with construction taking place between 1967 and 1970. At this time, however, there was still ongoing discussions about the segment of the highway south of DuPont Street, it was unknown whether that section of the highway would be at grade or elevated. Opposition to the project, however, would quickly begin to spring up. At the south end of the proposed route, residents of the village of Forest Hill and the Annex neighborhood began to organize their opposition to the project. They would be joined by residents from the Rosedale neighborhood which opposed the Crosstown Expressway for which the Spadina Expressway was to have a connection with. On the other hand, the Township of North York supported the project, seeing it as a vital connection between it and downtown Toronto. As well, the builders of the proposed Yorkdale Shopping Centre also came out in support of the project, going so far as to say that it was critical to the proposed mall, and if the highway wasn't built then neither would Yorkdale Mall. Metro Toronto itself would obviously support the highway project, and felt that the Yorkdale Mall development was needed. 
Opposition to the project would steadily grow, with the Cedarvale Ratepayers Association disrupting meetings of the Metro Roads Committee discussing the project. The Township of York opposed the highway being built in its municipality and opposed the highway being built through the Cedarvale Ravine, which the Township owned. The Township of York would describe the ravine as the only park area west of Bathurst Street and north of St. Clair Avenue available to serve 100,000 citizens. Some would call for a study on whether or not the highway was needed or not and to look at building the highway along Dufferin Street instead. The Township of York would even threaten to go to the Supreme Court to block Metro Toronto from taking the Cedarvale Ravine. Then Chairman of Metro Council Frederick Gardner would state, I can't see how anyone would allow one of 13 municipalities to block an expressway. Throughout 1961, the Metro Roads Committee would hold hearings for the proposals for the project. Here, the village of Forest Hill would state its opposition to the project in its current form, citing the proposed highway's economic effects on the village and the fact the highway would cut the village in half. The interchange at Eglinton Avenue, for example, would require the demolition of 276 buildings. Instead, the village would propose the highway travel under Forest Hill in a tunnel. Frederick Gardner, who himself was a former Reeve of Forest Hill, would lament that the highway would be harmful to the village, but there is urgent need for an expressway to serve the Northwest Metro area, and the current alignment was the only one that would allow the highway to run in the Cedarvale Ravine. At the time, Metro's overall goal was to build an expressway to connect to the Gardner Expressway, although Metro and the City of Toronto disagreed on where it should be. Metro would have preferred it to be built along Spadina Avenue and just be part of the Spadina Expressway, while the City of Toronto preferred the highway to be closer to Christie Street. Ultimately, in June of 1961, the segment of the highway between Bloor Street and the proposed Crosstown Expressway would be cancelled. This would end the dispute between Metro Toronto and the City of Toronto. Instead, Spadina Avenue between Bloor and the Crosstown Expressway would be widened. Ratepayer groups would continue to organize and form massive coalitions such as the Coordinating Committee of Toronto Ratepayers Associations and the Metro Ratepayers Transportation Committee. Ratepayers would object to the entire $400 million expressway plan, seeing it as expensive and unleashing a torrent of private passenger vehicles into the city centre. University of Toronto professor James Ackland would speak about the futility in trying to combine an expressway and rapid transit line together, stating that they won't persuade anyone to park his car and take rapid transit when there is a wonderful expressway inviting him to drive downtown. This was in reference to the plan to extend the Young University subway line to Wilson Avenue as part of the expressway plan, with a portion of the line running along the center median. S.A. Hudson, who was the president of the Lawrence Heights Ratepayers Association, would cite figures showing the highway carrying 10,000 vehicles into and out of the downtown core during rush hour, and that this would equate to approximately 69 acres of parking space being needed. These ratepayer groups would begin taking out ads in newspapers leading up to the December 12th meeting of Metro Council urging for a rejection of the project. The project would go to Metro Council on December 12, 1961, where they would approve the commitment of $5 million, which is about $44.6 million today, to the highway in a 13 to 8 vote. However, this commitment was only for a small 3 kilometer stretch of the highway from Wilson Avenue to Lawrence Avenue as a means to both appease the developers of Yorkdale Mall, but also because this section of highway would be built on empty land, so land acquisition costs and opposition would be minimal. This short stretch of highway would be sometimes referred to as the Baby Expressway due to its short length. At the same council meeting, the members of Metro Council would put off the approval of the remainder of the highway and voted 19-2 to in favor of cancelling the Crosstown Expressway. While Metro had approved a short section of the route, the decision to postpone the remainder of the highway would throw the entire project into doubt. 
This was because at the time the province of Ontario was paying for half of the road costs but didn't contribute to the rapid transit costs. The province wanted Metro to approve the whole project and the Minister of Transportation, William Goodfellow, would write to Metro Council to state that, since they did not approve the entire project, the province would not consider the construction of an interchange with Highway 401. While the section of highway between Wilson Avenue and Lawrence Avenue was now all but certain, there was still discussion about what was to happen south of Lawrence. Because of this, the Metro Roads Committee would begin studying proposals and hold public hearings. As an aside, it is this uncertainty that caused the extension of the subway to Shepherd to take priority over the extension to Wilson. North York Council would vote unanimously in favor of supporting the construction of the entire project and Councillor Irving Paisley would say that downtown business interests were behind the opposition. He would state that the whole scheme is being jeopardized by several organizations with political strings, local grievances or selfish aims. Paisley would join the developers of Yorkdale Mall, Webb and Knapp, in organizing a support campaign for the project. Paisley himself would write submissions from eight North York Ratepayers associations, although interestingly enough, some of these associations were defunct. The group would also begin a letter writing campaign. Public hearings for the project would begin, and over 30 ratepayers associations would square off with each other at these meetings. The strongest support from the project would come from the borough of North York, while opposition was located in the city of Toronto, the borough of York, and the village of Forest Hill. Opponents of the project would also oppose the use of property taxes to build the highway and instead proposed a $10 auto tax and a $25 truck tax to pay for it. They would also say that Metro should complete the Gardner Expressway and the Don Valley Expressway before constructing any others. The Reeve for the Borough of York, William Saunders, would publicly announce the borough's intention to fight the project and take Metro Toronto to court. The project would require the Cedarvale Ravine, which by law could not be taken by Metro without the consent of York. The Metro Roads Committee would ask the Metro Legal Committee to look into getting provincial legislation for the seizure of the lands as a result. On February 19, 1962, the Metro Roads Committee would approve the entire highway by a vote of 5 to 1, with the only dissenting vote coming from Toronto Mayor William Dennison. Chairman of Metro Council William R. Allen would speak out in favor of the project based on the inclusion of the subway extension which included commuter parking lots at the northern stations and would say that If this does not get the motorist out of his vehicle and back onto rapid transit, Metro Council cannot be blamed. On March 6, 1962, Metro Council would vote 14 to 8 in favor of constructing the entire highway. Construction on the section between Lawrence Avenue and Wilson would begin in 1964. This approval also allowed Metro Toronto to begin the purchase of land and property, although construction of the rest of the highway could not begin until after the 1967 budget. By 1963, the cost of the project had grown from $65 million to $76 million, which is about $666.4 million today. As well, Metro Toronto was also constructing the Gardner Expressway, the Don Valley Expressway, and the Bluer Danforth Subway at the same time, and so the Ontario Municipal Board began to scrutinize Metro's spending. This was because the Ontario Municipal Board had to approve the 1963 budget before Metro Toronto could, and the Spadina Expressway was separated from the budget, leading to hearings about it. At these hearings, the Township of Forest Hill and York noted their objections alongside various ratepayer groups. Ultimately though, the Ontario Municipal Board would uphold the project, stating, Sectional interest must give way to the public need of the larger area. On the topic of the Lost Ravine Parklands, the Municipal Board would state, The Board should and does expect that any parkland that may be lost to York Township as a result of this undertaking will be replaced insofar as may be possible in the circumstances 
by suitable alternative lands for that purpose. Regardless, construction of the first segment of the highway between Wilson Avenue and Lawrence Avenue had begun in January of 1963. The province would also construct the interchange between the expressway and Highway 401 as part of its expansion of Highway 401 from 4 lanes to 12. Four lanes of traffic would open in 1964 between Lawrence Avenue and Yorkdale Mall to allow access to said mall. The entire six lanes of traffic as well as the interchange with Highway 401 would open in 1966. Concurrent to that, Metro would also begin the preliminary work on the southern section of the highway with the demolition of homes and the digging of a trench as far south as Eglinton Avenue. This trench would be completed by 1969. By this point, York Council had dropped its opposition to the project after coming to an agreement with Metro Toronto. In exchange for the Cedarvale Ravine, Metro Toronto agreed for the creation of 12 acres of parkland elsewhere in the borough. This new park, however, would require its own expropriations. As one may expect though, this plan was met with opposition by residents of York which opposed the expropriations for the park which would have cost $4 million. That's about $32.2 million today. Instead, if the highway was to be built through the ravine then the residents of York would push for that segment of the highway to be decked over and a new park built on top. This plan was estimated to cost $5 million, which is about $40.3 million today, and Metro Toronto would eventually bow to the pressure and agree. As construction proceeded, opposition to the project continued to grow further, especially within the city of Toronto where a new group known as the Stop Spadina Save Our City Coordinating Committee formed. This group would be made up of ratepayers, students, academics, politicians, and was led by University of Toronto professor Ted Powell. Among the members of this group was a woman named Jane Jacobs who moved into the Annex neighborhood in 1969 and had previously helped fight the Lower Manhattan Expressway in New York City. Another member of the group, Marshall McLuhan, would state, Toronto will commit suicide if it plunges the Spadina Expressway into its heart. Our planners are 19th century men with a naive faith in an obsolete technology. In an age of software, metro planners treat people like hardware. They haven't the faintest interest in the value of neighborhoods or community. Their failures to learn from the mistakes of American cities will be ours too. In 1967, Metro Toronto would give its approval for the remainder of the highway. The highway would travel south under Cedarvale Ravine to Davenport Road and then south along Spadina Road to Bloor Street. Spadina Avenue would then be widened south to Lakeshore Boulevard. The highway would also eventually be extended north to Shepherd Avenue. From there, Dufferin Street would be expanded all the way up to Highway 7. The completion date for the Spadina Expressway was now set for 1975. In 1969, Metro would decide to rename the Spadina Expressway as the William R. Allen Expressway after Metro Council's second chairman. As well, by this time, Metro Council had learned that it would cost an additional $80 million, about $572.6 million today, to build. By 1969, the cost of the highway, including the subway extension, had ballooned to $237 million. That's about $1.69 billion today, with $153 million of it, $1 billion today, alone being required for the highway. This leap in cost forced Metro Toronto to halt the project in order to review it. The cost escalation would also mean that Metro Toronto would have to borrow money, which required the approval of the Ontario Municipal Board. By this point, the escalating costs of the project alongside the escalating opposition to it began to have a tangible effect, as the 1969 municipal election would see the first wave of anti-expressway politicians elected to city councils in Metro Toronto, such as Colin Vaughan and John Sewell. Homes had been demolished, two streets were wiped off the map, and a park cut in two and an entire neighborhood now lay divided by the highway south of Lawrence. Metro Roads and Traffic Commissioner Sam Cass had even gone against Metro's wishes and tried to commit Metro to the construction of the highway south of Eglinton Avenue by putting out a call for tenders to build the tunnel under the ravine. 
This call was only caught a day before it was to be published and was cancelled by Metro Chairman Albert Campbell. By September of 1969, construction of the highway stopped and the Ontario Municipal Board was asked to review the project. Metro Toronto would conduct its own review of the project which recommended the completion of the expressway and the tunnel under the Cedarvale Ravine. Metro Toronto would then go to the Ontario Municipal Board to request permission to borrow funds and request hearings for the project. These hearings would begin on January 4, 1971 and proceed for 16 days. During these hearings, various opposition groups would band together to form the Spadina Review Corporation and hired one of Canada's top lawyers, Johnson Josiah Robinette, to plead their case. They would base their case around the factors of pollution, destruction of homes, and increased road traffic. They would also call upon various witnesses including local residents, urban planners, economists, architects, and Jack Fensterstock, who was from New York's Department of Air Resources. Metro Toronto would be represented by its solicitor and would call upon Metro and City Administrators as well as an American Transportation Planner, Alan Voorhees. Metro Toronto would base its case around its technical studies and the need to manage expected traffic increases. After 16 days of hearings, the Ontario Municipal Board would vote 2-1 to one in favour of letting the project proceed. Undeterred, however, the Spadina Review Corporation, on advice from its lawyers, would appeal the decision to the Ontario Cabinet. While Metro Toronto wanted to continue construction on the highway, they would agree to wait until after a decision had been made by the provincial government. This delay would push back the completion date of the highway to 1977. In 1971, Ontario Premier John Robarts would retire and be replaced by William Davis, also known as Bill Davis, who agreed to hear the appeal and would give a final decision before the October election. On June 2, 1971, Premier Bill Davis would stand up before the Ontario Legislature and announce that he had reached a decision and that it could not be appealed. In a stunning decision that no one saw coming, Premier Bill Davis would announce that he sided with the residents and that work on the Spadina Expressway would cease. In his decision, Premier Bill Davis would make his famous declaration, Cities were built for people and not cars. If we were building a transportation system for the automobile, the Spadina Expressway would be a good place to start. But if we are going to build a transportation system for people, the Spadina Expressway is a good place to stop. In one fell swoop, Metropolitan Toronto's highway ambitions were dead. This decision would send shockwaves through the municipalities of Metro Toronto and the ramifications would be massive and are still felt to this day. Premier Davis, however, would approve the subway extension to Wilson Station and the province would now pay 75% of the cost. Opponents of the highway had argued that the city should promote public transit as a means to reduce car use and pollution. Mayor of Toronto William Dennison would say it's shocking that a group who never at any time suggested workable alternative routes had successfully opposed something as important in the growth of Metro as was the Don Valley. On the other hand, Metro Chairman Albert Campbell was incensed by the decision and stated it may mean that we will never build another expressway. Metro Toronto was enraged at the decision made by the province and considered suing the province for breach of the 1963 contract. This, however, never occurred. Now, Metro Toronto had a short 3-kilometer highway that went nowhere and a 2-kilometer trench with nothing in it. This trench, often nicknamed the Spadina Ditch or the Davis Ditch, was complete with overpasses and space for the ramps, but it was not paved and now it seemed like it wouldn't be. Suggestions were made for what could be done with the trench. These ranged from housing to parking for the subway to a park. An urban designer, Buckminster Fuller, would be commissioned to come up with a plan for the site. He would do so with what was called Project Spadina. This was an elaborate plan that included shops, residence schools, and offices in climate-controlled, pyramid-shaped buildings. 
This was met with a cool reception by municipal officials and nothing ever came of this proposal. In 1972, Metro Toronto would carry out its own study on what should be done with the trench. This study would examine the construction of an arterial road to Eglinton Avenue, a parking garage, or closing the entire expressway south of the 401. The latter proposal was rejected as being not possible and it would limit access to the Yorkdale shopping mall. The report would recommend the construction of a four-lane arterial road to Eglinton Avenue, as well as the construction of parking garages at the proposed Lawrence West, Glen Cairn, and Eglinton West stations. This idea, however, was quickly rejected by the province as it was viewed as an extension of the expressway which the province had stopped. All ideas for what to do with the trench were unworkable and so the trench would remain empty for now. Without the southern portion of the line, now a lost cause, there was no longer a need for the Crosstown Expressway and so it was permanently removed from official plans in 1973. While nothing was going to happen on the south end of the road, there was still potential for the northern extension of the expressway depending on what happened with the nearby Downsview Airport. Due to the abrupt stop of the highway at Lawrence Avenue, traffic was spilling out onto local streets and support for an expansion of the highway was slowly beginning to grow. Supporters for the expansion would form a group called Go Spadina, which would be led by local resident Esther Shiner. Due to the political situation making it impossible to build any sort of expressway in the area, Metro Toronto would shift its attention to the Scarborough Expressway project and began working on a new transportation plan in 1972. Metro Toronto would approve of a plan to construct a four-lane arterial road in the trench, although it would take another three years before the province would approve the plan. In 1973, Esther Shiner would be elected to North York Council and would further rally support for the southern extension of the highway. The Spadina Expressway would become a political question yet again during the 1975 provincial election. In that same year, Metro Toronto would review the final report about what was to be done in regards to the highway plan. This report presented six options, four of which had no new expressway development, one contained new expressways but only in the northwest area of Toronto, and one retained the plan from 1966. This report would state that there was a severe road deficiency in the northeast end of Toronto and that if Metro wanted new expressways there then an extension of Highway 400 to the Gardner Expressway or at least to St. Clair Avenue would be better than an extension of the Allen Expressway. An extension of Highway 400 as well as the Richview Expressway would be given serious consideration. As well, this report would solidify the idea that stopping the Spadina Expressway was the right thing to do. The port would recommend, however, that an extension of the Spadina Expressway to Eglinton Avenue at least as a four-lane arterial road would be a worthwhile endeavor. If not as a highway, then Highway 400 as well could be extended south to St. Clair Avenue as a four-lane arterial road. As well, it was recommended looking at a northern extension of the Spadina Expressway to the proposed Highway 407 north of Toronto in Vaughan. The City of Toronto alongside many activists would oppose all of these road plans, however. Metro Toronto, however, would pass the proposal for arterial roads south of the Allen Expressway and Highway 400, seeing them as good compromises. While Metro may have preferred Highway 400 be extended all the way down to either the Gardner Expressway or St. Clair Avenue, they did not want to go through this fight again. Those who opposed the plan saw it as a betrayal of the 1971 agreement and would appeal to Premier Davis to uphold his statement. Premier Davis, however, would side with the Ghost Spadina Group as he saw the arterial road plan as different. Simply put, they weren't expressways. Davis would, however, stick to his conviction that the Spadina Expressway would not extend south beyond Eglinton Avenue. As part of this project, Dufferin Street between the Allen Expressway and Shepherd Avenue would also be expanded as an arterial road extension. This was done instead of an extension to the proposed Highway 407, as land acquisition north of Shepherd would be difficult. 
In July of 1976, the Allen Road extension opened, although this road had no lights at the time as Metro could not decide if it should use normal lighting or highway lighting. The latter would eventually be chosen. In 1978, the speed limit of the extension would be raised to match that of the six-lane highway to its north, although the Allen Expressway and Allen Road were still considered different entities, although for all intents and purposes, with the raised speed limit, it was essentially just an extension of the highway at this point. In order to prevent a further southern extension of the highway, the province would broker a deal with Metro Toronto in which Metro would hand over a one meter wide strip of land south of Eglinton Avenue, and in return, the province would build the Black Creek Drive extension of Highway 400 for free. Officials at Metro Toronto, however, would drag their feet on the proposal and attempted to have the buffer strip moved down to Bathurst Street and St. Clair Avenue to allow a future extension to Bathurst Street. The province, however, was not having any of this and simply made it clear that if Metro wasn't going to give the province the land, then the province would simply take it by expropriation and bill Metro for half of the cost of the construction of Black Creek Drive. The one meter buffer strip of land would, have, would be handed over in 1984. On his final day in office, Premier Bill Davis would hand over that one meter buffer strip to the City of Toronto with a 99 year lease, thus preventing any possible extension of the highway. Supporters of the highway, such as Esther Shiner, had hoped that the province would hold on to the lands and hope a future Premier would be more open to the idea. Shiner would state, The expressway will be built, bit by bit, into the city. It was believed that a four-lane extension of Allen Road to Davenport Road would cost $20 million, which is about $44.8 million today. North York City Council would appeal to Premier David Peterson to reconsider the plan, however he refused to meet representatives over the issue. Esther Shiner would attempt to have a metro-wide referendum on the issue, although this would fail. North York would sponsor a telephone survey on the issue to source support for the project, but this would backfire as most respondents preferred public transit improvements. For Esther Shiner, her push for the Spadina Expressway extension would come to an end in 1987 after losing a battle to cancer. Metro Chairman Dennis Flynn and Metro planners would continue to push the plan into 1988 with the release of a study that recommended the highway be extended south. This discussion, however, would be defeated by a vote of 14 to 12 on July 5, 1988. With the retirement of Sam Cass, the Metro Roads and Traffic Commissioner, the topic of an extension of the Allen Expressway was dead. There was simply no one left with an appetite for it. In 1996, Metro would sell the 112 expropriated properties it had south of Eglinton Avenue, bringing this story to an end. The story of the Spadina Expressway is an important one in Toronto's history, although it is not unique to it. This is a story that played out in cities across North America in a time when highways were king. It was a time when highways were built pretty much wherever they could be and would more often than not be blasted through urban cores. Toronto is no different in this regard as seen by the Gardiner Expressway. Yet, Toronto's experience with the Spadina Expressway is also not unique as one only needs to look at New York City and the fight against the Lower Manhattan Expressway or San Francisco and the fight with the Embarcadero Expressway. Compared to many American cities, however, Toronto got off pretty well. Some urban centers have been devastated by their highway infrastructure. And some have gone to an insane expense to correct the errors of the past, like for example the Big Dig in Boston. The Spadina Expressway saga is the story of Toronto coming to terms with its future. Was the city going to become an American city with a lifeless urban core destroyed by highways, or was Toronto going to be something different? The Spadina Expressway saga is the story of civic activism on a scale never before seen in the city. Yet while we have all heard of the protests and names like Jane Jacobs, what gets lost in the shovel is the political fights as well. The Spadina Expressway wasn't just a Toronto versus the subway ordeal. 
York and Forest Hill would also fight the highway with York even threatening to take Metro Toronto to court over it. The Spadina Expressway saga is the defining movement for Premier Bill Davis who would solidify his legacy as a man who understood it takes more than just cars to build a great city. And in the 1960s and 70s, that was hard to come by. The Spadina Expressway, or Allen Expressway as it is known today, is a stump of a highway that goes nowhere and likely never will. There have been fantasy proposals for extensions to the highway and even during the 2010 mayor's race, candidate Rocco Rossi proposed extending the highway in a tunnel all the way to the Gardner Expressway, although this proposal also had no interchanges between Eglinton Avenue and the Gardner, so that kind of stunted its use. It was the zeitgeist of the time that created the Spadina Expressway, a time when the car was put on a pedestal and planners had no qualms with wiping entire neighborhoods off the map in an effort to build what they believed were the cities of tomorrow. Cities in which the car was the dominant form of travel and all else was irrelevant. We can now look back using hindsight to see that this belief was more destructive than helpful and Toronto is lucky that it was only the Gardner Expressway and the Don Valley Parkway that were truly built to their fullest extent. Had it not been for the men and women who fought for their homes and a sympathetic premier in office, it's quite possible Toronto would just be another North American city with devastated neighborhoods, a downtown core cut up and scarred by highways, reduced to nothing but an automotive hellscape. Ultimately though, the Allen Expressway is a reminder of the past and marks a defining moment in Toronto's history where the city and its residents would decide what kind of city they wanted it to be. And for that reason, while short and lacking purpose, the Allen Expressway is without a doubt one of the most important pieces of infrastructure in the city, if only for what it represents. And with that, I will end this video here. Probably the biggest single menace to Toronto right now is the Spadina Expressway. The minute you take an expressway into, not up to, but into the dense part of the city, then you have very large numbers of cars coming on and going off at certain restricted points. At those points, you get into terrible traffic jams. Uh, the traffic has to pan out right there. Thank you for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it and want to see more like it, please hit that subscribe button because there are more videos like it on the channel, and there are more videos like it on the way. If there's anything you want to say about the Allen Road Expressway, or Spadina Expressway, they're both the same thing, then don't be afraid to do so down in the comments section down below. And with that, I'll see you in the next video.